Welcome to the first video in the online series on musical form. Uh, here we are going to discuss a few things. Firstly, and most importantly, we're going to answer the question why one would want to study musical form. Secondly, we're going to look at uh, some of the ways form is traditionally taught and what is wrong with those. Uh, and thirdly, we're going to get into a brief and rather superficial discussion of some of the basic elements of musical form. A musical composition should not require the listener to have a special understanding of formal principles. To contradict this assertion would be like saying that an average homeowner must understand the intricacies of carpentry in order for his or her kitchen table to stand up. In fact, it would be quite disadvantageous for a composer to rely on the musical sophistication of the listener for his or her composition to function properly. The music should stand on its own as a coherent whole that proceeds through time in a logical manner. This said, one might ask, why study form at all if an understanding of it is not required to enjoy a given piece? Well, the answer really depends on one's relationship to music. For the composer, the answer to this question should be obvious. To reuse the analogy from before, a carpenter must understand, at the very least, basic formal principles in order to make a table that stands upright. For the performer, the answer is somewhat less obvious. In order to clearly and convincingly convey a work to an audience, a performer must understand how it is structured. It is perhaps more easily understood with the analogy of a narrator. If a story is read aloud with absolutely no variety of inflection and timing, it will be very difficult for the listener to comprehend the basic plot, let alone the more subtle aspects of the work. A narrator cannot convey these differences if he does not understand the basic formal units of prose himself. As for the general listener, I can only suggest two reasons for studying form. The first, and most obvious, is simply out of curiosity. The second is more a question of art appreciation. With an understanding of form, it is much easier to identify the aspects of a great composition that make it so unique. We are so often trapped by the argument of authority because we don't have a good enough understanding of the material at hand to either contradict or truly agree with a given proposition. An understanding of form is certainly empowering in this way, although it is not, by any means, the entire solution to the problem. Musical form is generally taught in such a way that belittles or completely ignores the details that make a given work unique. For example, the structure of a work is often summarized by denoting sections with letters of the alphabet. This method completely ignores the question of why a piece is structured in a certain way and does not account for the small deviations in similar sections that are, in fact, essential to understanding form. After all, it is generally in deviating from the basic formula that a work becomes interesting. To investigate these subtle or even striking differences, archetypal formal molds are quite simply insufficient. In order to illustrate this point, I would like to compare two expositions from Beethoven's piano sonatas. In the opening movement of this work, Beethoven has composed a clearly marked eight-measure opening theme. This is followed by a transition that modulates to the relative major of A-flat and leads into the secondary theme. In this work, Beethoven also opens with a clear-cut eight-measure theme. However, instead of jumping directly into an obvious transition, he fools the listener into thinking he is going to repeat the opening eight measures. The opening idea takes a new turn and is retrospectively heard as a transition to the second theme in the relative major of B flat. Using letters and the standard sonata form archetype, a typical analysis of both pieces yields virtually identical results. However, the interesting details of the respective works are lost. For example, in Opus 2, number 1, nothing is said of the fermata, the prominent modal coloring of the subordinate theme, 
or the fact that a strong cadence in the secondary key is postponed until the downbeat of measure 41. Similarly, in opus 49 number 1, the unexpected turn of the basic idea is not accounted for in a meaningful way. All of these subtle details have formal consequences and, as such, should be accounted for in a formal analysis. In order to lay a groundwork that can be subjected to a progressively more detailed investigation, it is useful to define a formal hierarchy. I must point out, however, that the art of musical form does not consist of simply filling in these designated formal building blocks. There's nothing in this overall scheme that dictates, for example, how long and abrupt a transition should be, or what the proportion of perceived time should be between the opening and subordinate themes of a sonata movement. In any case, these questions are dependent on the musical material at hand and cannot be analyzed in any great depth on a general level. You may take note here that this is yet another reason why the letter-based analysis using formal archetypes is not ideal. To facilitate understanding, I will use the well-known model of sonata form to describe the aforementioned hierarchy of formal units. Keep in mind, however, that composition is not restricted to the particular arrangements that have been defined by theorists. It is only natural that music theory describes the most prevalent forms and the most common features thereof. One can think of it in terms of a mathematical analogy as the lowest common denominator. This said, there are many great works written in forms that either deviate significantly from these defined archetypes, or bear little or no resemblance to them at all. The five possibilities for large formal units in sonata form are labeled as follows. The introduction, the exposition, the development, the recapitulation, and the coda. The inner three units are always present, and the outer two are more prominent in music from the high classical period onward. Each can be broken down further into its constituent parts, which provide progressive logic on a smaller scale. This includes individual themes and the transitions that join them. The boundaries of these units are usually defined by cadences and or modulations. Nonetheless, there are non-modulating transitions and cadential situations that blur the exact boundaries between two given units. As is usually the case, the theory is a rather rigid model of the art it represents. Themes and transitions can be broken down even further into smaller units where the immediate destination of a basic idea can be described in detail. This is the area in which William Kaplan, the author of the main text for this series, has done most of his work by further defining these smaller units and classifying them according to their particular characteristics. His work, however, is focused on the music of Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, even though it does describe formal principles present in the works of other composers from various periods. These small units and their respective characteristics will be the topic of the next several episodes. Contrary to the hierarchy presented here, the discussion will now proceed by describing the smallest units and gradually building upon them until a more impressive structure is achieved. I've created a few assignments that go along with this video that might be beneficial for you to do. Uh, email me if you want a copy of those at drusical at gmail.com. That should appear at the bottom of the screen right now. Also, if you want feedback on your work, please email me your finished uh, assignments to the same address and I will get back to you as soon as I can.